Uh, I am Alan Cameron and I served in Korea with the King's Own Scottish Borderers in 1951 and 52. And we arrived in Korea from Hong Kong, where we'd been stationed before. And uh, uh, it was a bit of a shock because we had expected to have a, a leisurely disembarkation, but it was the start of the big Chinese drive down through Kapyong. And uh, so we were suddenly told we had to be up at Kapyong the next morning. Uh, we arrived, as I say, and were driven up to a uh, rendezvous point and just bedded down on the ground that night. We all had a, a blanket with us and a, a great coat and we just put that over us and woke up next morning with frost all over the great coat, which was a bit of a shock having just come from Hong Kong. <laughs> um, and then the Argyles who we were taking over from came through and left and we went up to the Capion front and spent the next three days digging in and withdrawing, dig in, withdraw, um, marching back about uh, seven or eight miles each day. Uh, so it was a bit of a uh, abrupt entry into the war, uh, but uh, we didn't actually have any contact at that time with the Chinese or the North Koreans. Um, from there, uh, we went into a reserve position and then moved to another position just north of Seoul, where we did have contact in the battalion, but I, at that time, was a bit of a spare file in the battalion because I'd been second in command of A Company when we arrived, but when the Argonos left, they left someone who then took over that position and I had nothing special to do. So when our intelligence officer was injured in a traffic accident, I took over as intelligence officer for about six or eight weeks. Uh, the, the battalion then moved from that position over to the Kansas line, just south of the Han River. And uh, I then took over a platoon. Uh, we were in a defensive position there, and there were minefields all around. And I remember uh, that on one occasion a Korean man was coming down the road towards our position and walking along the embankment on the side, which I knew was mined, and all the Jocks were shouting at him and wailing, saying, get off onto the road, and he didn't. So he just kept on walking till he hit a mine. So I then had to go into the minefield to get him out, and our regimental aid post came up and took him away in a stretcher jeep. Um, uh, shortly after that, I was given a different job where I was training potential NCOs at a battle school about um, 15 miles behind the front line. And I did that again for about uh, eight weeks, uh, during which the battalion had a very uh, stiff battle. When they crossed the ham and advanced up with Op Commando, um, so, uh, I was then went back to the battalion as a second in command again of A Company, and in November we had a, a big battle uh, where a Chinese division attacked the battalion position, and uh, it overran two of our companies, but um, my company was in reserve 
and we were expected to do a counter-attack, but that was cancelled, so nothing really happened. And after that I was became a platoon commander again in A Company. And uh, we pulled back to a, a shoulder on Hill 355, which was the big hill in the centre of the uh, division's line, the front line position. Uh, and one night when we were on, the, on there, I went, was going around my sentries at about 10 o'clock at night, and uh, 14th Field Regiment, uh, Royal Artillery had been firing over us all day in support of the Leicesters who were uh, just on our right front. And I suddenly realised that this latest salvo was sounding very close and in fact it came in and hit our position while I was walking along. And I uh, received a wound in my chest and in my left arm. Um, my platoon sergeant uh, and medical orderly who we had trained in the platoon gave me first aid and then some volunteers carried me down the, the, the hill at the back about a thousand yards and uh, I was taken off by a stretcher jeep and ended up in an American MASH, a mobile advanced surgical hospital. Uh, 8055 MASH. Uh, well, I, I woke up, up just before I was operated on, and it was, uh, I was amused later when the television series MASH was uh, brought in to remember my experience, and it was exactly like it had been on the film. <laughs> um, and uh, I was evacuated from there over to uh, Curie, uh, where I spent, uh, that was on the 21st of November I was wounded and evacuated, and uh, the snow and winter arrived on the 23rd, because I remember a chap coming into the, uh, into the tent in the mash and he was covered in snow and standing his feet. <laughs> And I thought, yeah, I timed that rather well. And uh, I didn't manage to get back till early March when I rejoined the battalion. And again, I was a little bit surplus to uh, the establishment. So I was given a job digging uh, a defensive position along the Kansas line again as a reserve position for the division if, if it was needed. And again, two Korean peasant women uh, were uh, cutting the brush for firewood. And of course they did it in a minefield. So both of them got blown up. And again, myself and the sergeant who was with me, we had to crawl into this minefield very carefully and eventually drag these two women out and get them evacuated. So, um, uh, after that I became second in command of D Company and I just used to go up. I used to enjoy very much driving up. Uh, we'd go up uh, later uh, at night at about four o'clock in the morning to do our resupply of the front line and uh, uh, we'd go to a jeep head and then man pack with porters all the way uh, uh, to the front line about a thousand yards and uh, on the way back the dawn would be breaking and I remember it was such a lovely sort of feeling driving back to the camp uh, in the dawn in Korea. Uh, I really did enjoy that immensely. 
Um, and uh, then eventually in July uh, of 52, I was uh, put onto the advance party of the battalion, which was now due to return to Hong Kong, and I left Korea in July 1952. As you can see, I had, although I did spend uh, a reasonable bit of time actually in the front line with platoons, I never had any contact with anybody, with the enemy when I was doing it. So I had enjoyed my time in Korea, basically. <laughs> and had a couple of frights, but that was about it. <laughs> Have you been back to Korea? Yes, I've been back twice since then. What do you think? The first time I went back um, was privately. Uh, I, I went with my wife when, we, uh, when I retired from uh, work. And um, I, I was really surprised to see how big Sewell had got and how well uh, developed and everything else. Because my memory of Korea was that everybody was wearing white, all the peasants were wearing white, and there were no trees virtually on any of the hills. They'd all been either burnt off or shelled off by, with napalm and stuff. Or, and all the peasants collected the brushwork underneath it for all firewood. So I was really surprised when we drove up to my old platoon position in Kansas Line to see trees all over the hills and everybody dressed in what I would now call normal Western dress. It was the, th the, the thing that really impressed me uh, most. The next time I went back was an official visit when I took one of my grandsons with me uh, and that was in November 1913, uh, 2013 and um, I, I was uh, really quite humbled by the reception we were given and the way we were treated as such honoured guests um, and how everywhere we went talking to the ordinary people as soon as they knew we were veterans returning they all shook our hands and said thank you thank you and it was a very humbling experience but I could understand why because let's face it Seoul is only 30 miles from the border and, they, and the Koreans know what life is like on the other side of that border. Yeah. I think that's about all I have to say, really. Are there any interest to you? It was wonderful. I, I too am very grateful, and that's why I'm here. Mm. Thank you so much for your service. You're very correct. On the other side, the north of the 38th parallel, yeah. They can't enjoy the freedom and prosperity that we enjoy. No, I mean, oh, they live a terrible life in the north on the whole, don't they? Mm -hmm. uh, all the ordinary people, that is, do, yeah. So hopefully, in, our, in your lifetime, there will be one Korea. One does hope so, yeah. There are two other little incidents which I'd like to mention. Uh, first of all, uh, shortly after we arrived, we were given a company of Korean porters uh, whose job it was to carry all the resupplies and ammunition and stuff up the hills uh, so that the soldiers just did the fighting, shall we say. And <clears throat> At the presentation when they were brought to us, uh, our, uh, one of 
our major uh, Alan Smythe was in charge, but he uh, turned to the, this little sergeant who was actually going to be the person physically in charge of the uh, Porter's pl platoons and said to him, okay, they're all yours now. And this little sergeant walked forward about five paces and started screaming at the, the porters in a, a foreign language, which we didn't understand. And all the Koreans shocked to attention. And then he shouted something else and all the section leaders came out and formed a line in front of him. And he then went down the line, slapping each one on the face, left and right. And of course, Major Smythe went absolutely berserk, saying, what on earth are you doing? And he said, I'm just, I have just told them, sir, in Japanese, that during the, the uh, Second World War, I was a prisoner of the Koreans up here, having been captured in Hong Kong. And they were beastly to me then, and now I would be beastly to them if they didn't behave and do what I said. And we all thought, what a chap. <laughs> he had been two years in Korea with just a jersey and trousers, even through the winter. Uh, so he was, shall we say, a bit bitter about Koreans. Um, But the other uh, thing, when we were at the Kansas line where I rescued the two uh, women from the minefield, one of the porters there, because they were subject, although they were civilians, they were subject to military law. And this chap had been absent or something like that, and had been sentenced to two strokes of the cane every two hours. And every two hours, an officer or NCO would come along with a whippy cane. He would bend over, take his trousers down, and get two strokes of the cane on his backside. And we all thought, God, how uh, uncivilized can that can they be? It was really weird. Yeah, that's it. Do you know why he was wet? No, he, he, I think he'd been absent without leave. And literally, every two hours, they'd come on and give him with a cane on his back something. A Korean person? Yeah. Interesting. Yeah.